you are a warrior, it's time for you not to back up, not to give up, not to give in. Stop letting stuff derail you. Stop getting stuck. Every time life don't go your way, stop getting stuck. Stop quitting, stop giving up. Keep fighting in the midst of the struggle. Keep fighting, keep thinking positive, keep going. You only lose when you quit. Remember what makes you different from the weak. The difference between the weak and the strong is that when the strong have no more left, they fight, they fight, they fight. The weak, they quit, they give up, they give in, and there's nothing weak about you. So I need you to fight your way through it. Pretty soon, depending on the type of people you've associated with, distracted by your doubts within yourself, Never underestimate the power of influence and association. And never underestimate the power of your own consistent self-discipline. Now let's take a closer look at discipline, at the three steps to becoming disciplined. First, true discipline is not the easiest option. Most people would rather sleep until 10 o'clock than get up at 6. It's easier to go to bed late, sleep late, show up late, leave early it's easier not to read it's easier to turn on the television than to open a book it's easier to do just enough than to do it all waiting is always easier than acting trying is always easier than doing imagine what life would be like if we didn't have to make our bed in the morning or keep our garage clean or pay our taxes or show up for work tomorrow wouldn't it be fascinating if we didn't have to do these things, wouldn't it be fascinating? What do you suppose would become of us? You're right, not much. Results, every once in a while, you gotta take a measure, see how you're doing. Now we take a measure called results. What is the results at the end of the day, the results at the end of the week? You can't let too much time go by without checking. Six years I've been out there working when I met my teacher, Mr. Shilp. Shilp said, well, Mr. Rohn, let's just go through a little summary here. He said, in the last six years, how much money have you saved and invested? Let's go through a little tab list here. How much money have you saved and invested the last six years? I said, what? Zero. He said, you have messed up. He said, who sold you on that plan? I thought, my gosh, the man's right. I'm a nice guy. I bought the wrong plan. What if you were 50 and broke? Right? Didn't need to change countries. Bought the wrong plan. What a sad scenario that would be. But Shelf said these questions. Let's go through some results. He said, how many books have you read in the last 90 days? I said, what? Zero. Wisdom of the world available? Change your life, change your future? Wisdom of the world available, develop, develop any skill you want, earn the kind of income you want, have all the treasures you want, equities you want, relationship with your family that you want, everything that you want available, and the wisdom of the world to help you get it. Haven't read any books in the last 90 days. My teacher said, Mr. Rohn, you have messed up. I'm telling you, you've got the deal. Shelf said, Mr. Rohn, in the last six months, how many classes have you taken to improve your skills? or to develop new skills. Go for the American dream. Become rich and powerful and sophisticated and healthy and influential. How many classes have you taken in the last six months? I said, how many? Zero. He said, you have messed up. He said, you don't need to unmess the country. You don't need to straighten out the perplexed. You don't need to straighten out any of this stuff. All you've got to do is look within and let results teach you a great deal about your own activity your own attitude and your own philosophy. I went through that process. Take this phrase home. Results is the name of the game. What other game is there? If the peak is worth reaching, the climb is gonna be hard. I know, I know, I know you're ready to give up. I know, I feel you, you're ready to give in. You're like, I've never gone through this before. Or maybe you're at the darkest point of your life. 
and you're ready to give up. You're at a point in your life where you feel like it's do or die. You're going through so much pain. You're going through so much agony. You're ready to give up. You're ready to quit. Listen to me very carefully. You are a warrior and it's time for you to fight. The rewards of a disciplined life are great, but they're often delayed until some time in the future. The rewards for the lack of discipline are immediate, but they are minor in comparison to the immeasurable rewards of consistent self-discipline. An immediate reward for lack of discipline is a fun day at the beach. A future reward of discipline is owning the beach. For most, we choose today's pleasure rather than tomorrow's fortune. So how can you get rid of the easy distractions? How can you keep your mind on what you're trying to do? How can you keep an attitude of doing it all and doing it now? How can you make the choice of discipline over procrastination? How can you stay focused on your ambitions? You can keep your focus on your work. You can get it done today instead of tomorrow. You've got to really work on your consistent self-discipline on a daily basis, or you'll find yourself distracted. Distracted by negative thoughts, distracted by negative people, no second chance. No, what would I do differently? Choose one or the other, but both will have their price, the price of discipline or the price of regret. One costs pennies, the other a fortune. The first lesson of discipline is that it isn't the easiest option. The second lesson of discipline is that it's a full-time activity. And we've said that the best form of discipline is consistent self-discipline. You see, the discipline that it takes to make your bed every day is the same discipline necessary for success in the world of business. The discipline to organize your garage is the same discipline to organize your business. All disciplines carry through to affect all parts of our lives. If we're disciplined in just one area and lazy in another, guess what? Pretty soon, the lazy side will creep in and destroy the disciplined side. The bad habits in one area of our life will eventually destroy our self-discipline in the areas we've been working on. Consistency cannot be inconsistent. Discipline is the mind being trained to control our lives. Discipline is a set of standards which we've selected as a personal code of conduct. Discipline is imposing on ourselves the requirements for honoring these standards. Once we've adopted these standards of behavior and conduct, we're committed to honor them. And if we don't, then there can be no disciplined activity. We find ourselves announcing our standards to our relatives, our friends, our associates. We shout our beliefs and condemn those who believe any differently, but then we don't walk the talk. We end up acting in a way far different from the beliefs we've shouted. We tell our kids that the TV is rotting their minds, yet we spend our evenings in front of it. We tell our employees that they must take advantage of every minute of the working day, yet we spend three hours at lunch. Do as I say, not as I do. This is inconsistent. This leads to a loss of credibility among those who watch us. And more importantly, this leads to a loss of credibility within ourselves. The only thing worse than one who is inconsistent in applying their self-imposed disciplines is one who has never considered the need or the value of discipline at all. These people seem to wander aimlessly, changing procedures, changing standards, changing loyalties, and shifting frequently from one commitment to another leaving behind a trail of broken friendships, unfinished projects, and unfulfilled promises, all because of a discipline that was either non-existent or imposed so infrequently that it was ineffective. The system we live in and contribute to is designed to make the easiest things in life the most unprofitable. Profitable seems to be the most difficult. Our world is and always will be a constant battle between the life of ease and its momentary rewards and a life of discipline and its far more significant rewards. 
Each has its own price, the price of discipline or the price of regret. We will pay one or the other. What we wish we had done is the voice of regret, speaking in a sorrowful tone at a time when there is no going back. This is regret. Here's all life asks us to do, make measurable progress in reasonable time. Just take home that little phrase, good phrase. We're asked in life simply to make measurable progress in reasonable time. We demanded of our children, how many years do you want your child to spend in fourth grade? Approximately. About one. If it looks like they're not going to make it, we pour on the pressure. Call legitimate pressure. Lack of results. Peer pressure, family pressure, school pressure, community pressure. Every other kind of pressure we can bring to bear. What? You can't stay more than one year in fourth grade. What if they're nice kids? Wouldn't you give them three or four years? The answer's no. You've got to make better progress than that. So you've got to check fairly often. Some things you've got to check every day. Some things you've got to check at least by the end of the week. Salesman joins this little sales company. He's supposed to make 10 calls first week. Wouldn't it be legitimate? Call him in on Friday and say, John, what? How many calls? I mean, this stuff is simple. John says, well, I say, John, well won't fit in this little box here. Well. Now John starts with a story. You say, John, I made this little box so small so a story won't fit. <laughs> I don't need a story. I need what? A number. A number. What will a number tell me? Everything. John's supposed to make 10 calls. What if he made 20? You say, wow. Wow. We got somebody. What if he only made one call? Whoa. Will that tell us something about John's philosophy? And the answer is yes. Will it tell us something about his attitude? Of course. Will it tell us something about his disciplines? Of course. And if he wants a lesson in life change, all he has to do is be willing to face numbers and come up with the results that will teach you to either celebrate if you got good results or fix whatever needs to be fixed in your philosophy, attitude, activity called discipline. You don't need to go anywhere else. I do believe in affirmations, they are valuable as long as you affirm the truth, because it says in ancient scripts, the truth will set you free, free to do what? Amend your errors and pick up new disciplines. That's what the truth is for, to help us amend our errors and pick up the disciplines for life change. That's what the truth is for. So I do believe in affirming the truth. If you're broke, best thing to affirm is, I am broke. You put that up on the refrigerator where you can see it every day. And that's how you do that. I wish I had not waited 14 years. Somebody said, if you want to lose something, lose money. You can get that back. Eight out of 10 millionaires have been financially bankrupt. Walt Disney filed bankruptcy seven times and had oh. two nervous breakdowns. But don't lose time. There were 14 years I sat on the sideline. 14 yeah. years I said, I don't have an investor in me like Tony Robbins. 14 years that said, I don't have an MBA or a PhD and, and I can't compete with these guys. I have the complexion of rejection. And so I regret that because there are some people that maybe if they'd heard my voice, they would not have turned to drugs. If they'd heard my voice, their lives would have taken a different direction and I can't get those 14 years back that haunts me and may I think that drives me when I speak with such energy I'm, I'm trying to make up for that time but I can't and this era that fortune magazine has aptly called the era of possibilities I want you to look out on your personal life and on your professional life and I want you to think about something you want very badly just think about one goal that you'd like to achieve like my, my driving passion was to buy my mother a home because I appreciated mama adopting us. And I said, mama, that, that's something I want to do for you. And I, and I achieved that goal. And ladies and gentlemen, let me share something with you. There's nothing like doing something that you set out to do that gives your life some meaning and power and purpose. 
And that gave my life some meaning and power and purpose. And I'm, I'll never forget when we drove there and I gave her the key, she got out, she, oh my God. I said, nobody could have told me that, that, that you would have done this. And I was a bad, I mean, I was a problem kid, you know. My mom used to wear my butt out. <laughs> said, I'll whoop you behind until the cows come home. I said, I hope they hurry up. <laughs> But there was nothing like that achievement. Now here's something I want you to do. Think about some goal you want to achieve. And I don't want you to worry about how you're going to do it. That's not important. Just shut up. Get that. How is none of your business? Because of our mental conditioning, ladies and gentlemen, we unconsciously build a case on why we can't do something. When I wanted to go in the area of motivation, I started building a case for myself. Les, you can't do that. You've never worked for a major corporation. You can't do that. You don't have any college training. You can't do that. You don't have the money. You don't have the contacts. You've never done that before. What makes you think that you can make more money in one hour than most people make working for two or three months? How many of you have ever done wanted to do something? And just honest, answer honestly. How many of you have ever wanted to do something and you talk you out of it? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. All right, so you know that inner conversation. That's what I'm going to override tonight, all right? Now, by the way, when I get started, I get fired up. So don't pay me any attention. Let me take my goat off. I don't have much time, so I want to burn this up. Hold this for me. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. All I want you to do is hold the vision of what you want. I want you to think about that all the time. Hold the vision of what you want. Keep that in your mind's eye. I dreamed about constantly being on Robert Shuler's program. I thought about it all the time. See, ladies and gentlemen, our thoughts have power. Your thought is what you brought. So uh, people don't realize that. See, we can't control the thoughts that come in our minds, but we can control the thoughts that we dwell on. So your thoughts have magnetism. And the most challenging thing is to discipline your thinking, behold the vision of what it is that you want. That's the most difficult part. I saw myself on Robert Shuler's program. I saw myself being interviewed by Robert Shuler. I saw myself prepared to answer whatever question he asked. I was ready for him. I've been there a thousand times in my mind. At the end of the program, he said, it feel like I've known you before, like we've been together before. I said, we have been spiritually and mentally. I've been following you for a long time. I thought about it. See, I don't, this is no game to me. It's no memorized speech to me. I live this. I believe you don't teach what you don't know and you don't lead where you don't go. And most people, ladies and gentlemen, most of us go to our graves with our greatness in us. Most of us, ladies and gentlemen, most people, when they die, you can literally put under their names, dead but not used up yet. Because most people go through life holding back. Most people go through life not giving their all. Most people have their lives on hold. How many of you know you can do more than what you've been doing? Raise your hands, please. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that proves a point that we, we know we can do more than what we're doing and we're not doing it. Why? Why? I don't, couldn't understand that. I was born in Liberty City. I knew I could do more than what I was doing when I was working for the Miami Sanitation Department, when I used to go door to door selling television sets, no money down, when I was working for Sears when it was on Biscayne Boulevard. I knew I could do more than that, but I wasn't doing I was stuck because we don't do what we know. What we do is we operate in the context of the vision that we have of ourselves. See, I couldn't see how to do more. I knew I could do it, but I couldn't see it for me. I believed it. I didn't know it because if I knew it, I would have been manifesting it. So therefore, hold the vision of what it is that you want. The next thing is that whatever it is that you want to do, ladies and gentlemen, here's something that's very key for you. There must be on your part a willingness to do what is required, a willingness. If there are 75 things to do to achieve your goal, if there's one thing on that list of 75 that you're not willing to do, I guarantee you that's the first thing that will come up for you and will kick your butt. I want to have a conversation with y'all about unapologetically getting rid of all things, people, and situations that no longer belong in the new season of your life. Some of y'all came up with New Year's resolutions. You've already fell apart. You've already fell apart. New Year's resolution, Happy New Year. It's supposed to be Happy New You Year. All of your bad habits, surroundings, and situations, personal relationships that didn't make sense for your life back then. You're supposed to step into the Happy New You Year. So many of y'all are mental and spiritual psychological warfare so many of y'all are in spiritual chains you are spiritually behind bars 
you are stuck. You are institutionalized. Most of us have two eyes and we still can't see, can't clearly see all of the, the scams, the people's motives. God sends us bold signs and wonders, tells us to change our environment and our surroundings so that we can reach the ultimate level of being blessed. I really think that if you get rid of the trash in your life, can be people, business, and situations. You too could really, like I really believe that you can reach your full potential. I want you to fly. I want you and your career and your financial blessings to bypass me. This is a good word for anybody who you've been, you've been dealing with depression, but you've been drinking to get through it. Now, Depression is something that happens to a lot of us. I mean, I don't know anybody who hasn't had a season of darkness in their life. But if I try to drive out darkness with darkness, and I depend on something in the darkness that is going to make me addicted to something even when the light comes up, the second storm is worse than the first. And a lot of us are dealing with loneliness right now in this season. That's a storm that you can't always control. But if you run to places in the storm that are more dangerous than the storm itself, how many times have you, have you left a place that you didn't like? And the problem is, you can't change if you never stay. Staying power. Staying power. A subject that altered my life forever. It was just unbelievable. I hadn't known my mentor, Mr. Show, very long until one day he said, Mr. Ownsh, let me see your current list of goals. He said, I've had a lot of experience and I've been out here for a while. And he said, let's go over them and maybe I can really give you some good ideas. And I said, I don't have a list. He said, well, he said, if you don't have a list of your goals, he said, I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars, which he did. That got my attention. I said, you mean my bank balance would be a lot bigger if I learned how to set goals? He said, drastically bigger. That got my attention, so I finally said, hey, I want to learn how to set goals. It is a fantastic skill to develop how to design your own future. So make the note, life best lived is life by design, not by accident. Not just, you know, walking through the day, careening from wall to wall and managing to survive. You know, that's okay. But if you can start giving your life dimensions and design and color and objectives and purpose, the results can be absolutely staggering. Key phrase, here's a chance now to use your imagination. Because the imagination builds cities, imagination conquers disease, imagination develops a career. Imagination sets up a relationship. Imagination is where all tangible values and intangible values begin in the imagination. So what you've got to learn to do is use this powerful resource. Now sometimes all by ourselves, it's a little difficult sort of to get it going. That's why a little workshop like we're going to do today is sometimes very helpful. When someone does a little coaching and says, how about this, this niche, I never thought about that. That ought to be easy to do. And the first thing you know, you're going. And uh, that's why that is so important. But now, tapping this resource of the imagination and thinking about your future, thinking about tomorrow, as early as tomorrow or the rest of the day, and thinking on out the rest of the year, on into the next century, on into the early years of the next century. A workshop like we're about to do helps call your attention to that so you can Use your imagination to start prospecting for the future, what could be possible for you. We're affected by our dreams, our vision of the future. You got a problem? It's called anxiety. Here's the solution. It's called prayer. What's the result of prayer? Peace. Okay, if you're like, Rich, okay, but you don't understand. You don't know my story. You don't know about my life right now. I ain't got no time for peace. You never met my boss. Can't get no peace over there. You don't know my husband. Ain't no peace in my home. You don't know my situation. 
you would be absolutely correct, absolutely right. I don't know all of those factors and all of those variables, yet I'm not sure if you're listening to me tonight. What the scripture says is that when we go to God in prayer, what happens is we don't get man's peace, we get the peace of God. The peace of God is interesting because the peace of God transcends all understanding, meaning that God's peace is superior to your earthly situation. God's peace is illogical. So if you have a situation that doesn't make sense, good news, your God has peace that doesn't make sense. Listen, your situation might not change, but your soul will. When what you were guiding by goes away and every day just looks the same and feels the same, now I get the feeling like this is endless. Now I get the feeling like maybe these chains are never going to break. This storm is never going to cease. What you go through doesn't determine where you end up. What you go through doesn't determine where you end up. Who you listen to determines where you end up. Because I think right now you are walking through a valley between two voices. One is wisdom, one is worry. One is gratitude, one is grumbling. One is blame, one is faith. Wait a minute. The opposite of faith is doubt. No, 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 no. Doubt doesn't keep you from having faith. Doubt gives you something to have faith for, but blame will block faith every time. Blame will always block faith. You want to make sure that the greatest pull on your life is the pull of the future. Some people live in the past and let their life be continually pulled and influenced by the past. And yes, we must remember the past and review the past to make it useful to invest in the future. But here's the key. Make sure that the greatest pull on your life is the pull of the future. Now, if you're skimpy on your dreams, if you're skimpy on your objectives and your purposes, if that isn't very well planned, then it doesn't pull very hard. Then you have more of a tendency to be pulled by the past or to be pulled apart by events or circumstances or to be pulled apart by distractions. So in order to save yourself from being pulled apart by distractions or pulled back to the past, you want to now start really designing the future so that the greatest part of your attention and focus and pull, like a magnet, pulls you forward into the future to accomplish your goals. If you take a seed and throw it on the concrete and walk off, the sun just burn it up. You got to have dirt put on top of it. In my mind, it doesn't make sense that to grow something, you should dig a hole, put it down in there, and cover it with dirt. Logically, that don't make no sense to me. But oh, though, see, dirt is necessary for growth and development. Dirt builds character. Dirt gives you the push-through factor. Dirt makes you come with it when you don't feel like coming with it no more. All of y'all that had dirt thrown on you. And dirt ain't always what you want. It's somebody talking about you down on your job. It's somebody accusing you of something that you didn't do. It's somebody telling you you ain't gonna make it. That Everybody get dirt put on them. But see, when you're getting put under that stress, please know God is always working, so I smile. Because I know he back there. See, that dirt builds character in you. When they're talking about you, it teaches you to withstand it. Then it gives you something to push through. So when you put the seed and you put the dirt on it, if you understand stress, stress really ain't just dirt. See, they don't call it dirt when they plant it. They call it soil. Because, see, soil has nutrients in it. What the nutrients, when people are talking about you, dogging you, lying on you, backbiting, stealing from you, they're actually putting nutrients in you. They're building character. You got character now. And now the dirt is necessary so you can prove yourself. Everything you see above ground that blossoms and plants and grows and that's beautiful, it was underground one time. But if you're weak in learning to set goals, if you haven't really worked on this that we're going to work on, then that is a solution you need to consider. Goals are like a magnet. They pull. The stronger they are and the more purposeful they are, the bigger they are, the more unique they are, the stronger they pull. If you have excellent goals and high dreams, here's what they also do. They pull you through. Pull you through all kinds of down days, down seasons. They pull you through a winter of discontent. They pull you through 
distraction on every side that says, look here, look here, look here. Strong, powerful dreams like a magnet pull you through that. Strong dreams and goals pull you through a disaster. Some people get swallowed by the disaster because they have nothing on the other side of the disaster to pull them through. A bad day can almost overwhelm you if you don't have something really purposeful to go for at the other side of that day, at the other side of the difficult time, at the other side of the down time. If you've got plenty out there to attract and pull, it'll pull you through all these things and very little of it will attach itself to you. You'll be able to get through some of the most difficult times if you have this spectacular vision ahead of you of where you're going and what you're going to accomplish. Getting through will be easy or easier. So learning to set goals, it is an incredible experience. Once I learned it, it transformed my life forever. Being here today is an accomplishment of my goals. When I travel around the world, and sit on an airplane, I say, I dreamed about this one day. I used to go to the airport and watch the planes fly away. And I said, one of these days, I'll be on one of those planes. I dreamed about it. I dreamed about the other side of the world. I'd never been to Italy, but I dreamed about it. I'd never been to South Africa, but I dreamed about it. Sure enough, step by step and country by country and flight by flight, I started checking them off my list. It, it was the most exhilarating feeling. Powerful to set those goals, reach out there into the future, design something to the best of your ability, refine it as you go, tear it up periodically if you want to, set a whole new list. It's your life, it's your future. But now I would like to do it in a very simple, easy manner that you can follow so that you can use it for the future to pass on to your children. Or if you've got a little group that you train and teach or your management and salespeople, you can use this with others. So what I'm gonna go through with you here is sort of a model sort of, if I rush you just a little bit on getting through this model, at least I will leave you with the model that you can use later. And not only use later, but use later to pass on to someone else in some manner. So having laid this background now, here's what I want you to do. Get a fresh piece of paper. And this is called now the workshop. And on this workshop now, I want you to write down the question and then do the exercise. First question. List what five things have you accomplished that you're already proud of? What five things have you already accomplished that you're proud of? Now, primarily what this is for is to, you know, give you credit for what you've already accomplished. Shelf said to me, Mr. Owen, you've already been setting goals. You know, you've already gone for something and you've achieved it, but you've probably done it haphazardly. You haven't done it with a real plan in mind and you've accomplished some things. Now, if you start deliberately doing it, can you imagine how you can multiply the effect by five, by 10, by 20, by 100? I finally got the message. So first of all, you wanted to make sure I got credit for the things that I had already accomplished, especially in my own mind. You know, whether it's an accomplishment to someone else doesn't matter now, just so you recognize it for yourself. Now that you've done that little workshop, here's the second question. This is gonna take some time now. What do you want in the next 10 years. What do you want in the next 10 years? Now under this, what do you want in the next 10 years? That is the question. I want you to make a list of at least 50 items. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to just write as fast as you can. Don't give any much detailed thought to it of what you want in the next 10 years and just let your mind run free. Now also remember this, this is not what you think you can get. This is what you want. If it all fell into place and you could have everything you wanted in the next 10 years, what would you take? If somebody promised you can have anything you want in the next 10 years, what do you want? I want you to approach it that way because it's not important to think, what do I think I can get? I want you to now think about what you want in the next 10 years and put them one under the other, not side by side, but one under the other because we're gonna do something with this list when you finish. You don't have to just be shortchanged on this list. I mean, this list can go on and on and on. And if you're working this workshop and you've got plenty of time, you just, you know, give it plenty of time till everybody's pretty thoroughly, you know, ready now with this list. But now here's what I want you to do with this list. I want you to go through the list now, one item at a time, write down the list. And I want you to give each item a one, 
a three, a five, or a 10 by saying, that's about a one-year goal, that's about a three, that's about a five, that's about a 10. I want you to look at each item, write down the list and give it a one, three, five, or 10. Now, here's what I want you to do with this list. I want you to look at each item that you've numbered number one, and I want you to pick out the four most important and identify them some way. Either make a new list of the four most important one-year goals or circle them or put a star or something beside it. What are your four most important one-year goals? Now that you picked the four most important one-year goals, here's the next question. Why? Why are those four goals important to you? What are they going to do for you? What will they accomplish? Why did you pick those? Why? Why are those goals important? Just three or four sentences. If we don't have time to complete it, you can complete it later. If you have plenty of time doing this workshop, you just take the time. Why are those four goals important to you? Okay, put a little star there now that those little stars mean finish later. Okay, because you can continue on with this, you know, after, long after this workshop is finished and then use it as a model to teach. Remember, study, practice, teach. Now, make these notes. Next, when the why gets stronger, the how gets easier. When the why gets stronger, the how gets easier. When people don't have strong, powerful goals, the how is almost impossible. The how is too difficult. How to do it seems like, you know, how can I ever accomplish this? The how starts getting easier and easier when the why gets bigger and bigger and stronger. Now make this note. Purpose is stronger than object. Purpose is stronger than object. Object can be powerful, object can be strong, but purpose is stronger than object. One of your objectives might have been a million dollar home to live in. Here's the big question, what for? And it's the what for that pulls stronger than the million dollar home. You know, a home is a home is a home. What for? What are, you, what are you gonna do with this place? Well, now we start with the details. And I want you to add this note. It works in communication, it works here too. The drama is in the details. The drama is in the detail. Someone says, I've lost uh, 40 pounds in the last three months. We say, is that it? Those are the numbers, but what's the detail? How did you feel before? Well, let me tell you what. Now they start the drama by giving us the details. How do you feel now? Wow, what a difference, 40 pounds later. And this person starts to describe what it's like now versus what it was like before. The drama is in the details. This is what you've got to do. A million dollar home, what for? So everybody can see it from the street? That's okay, but there's gotta be some more reasons. What, you, what do you want to do with this home? Then you start to say, hey, it's going to be the center of activity. You can't believe what's going to go on in this home. And you just keep describing it. And that drama now starts to really tap your imagination. And imagination is the beginning of reality. You can't imagine how close imagination is to reality until you start practicing this craft of turning nothing into something, imagination into tangible, the real stuff. How close is the real stuff? You can't imagine how close. If you start tapping into this resource of your imagination so that your purpose becomes much stronger than the object. The object is powerful and it'll pull, but the purpose is unbelievable. We must all pay the price, but the price gets easy if the prize gets large. The price gets easy if the prize gets sufficient. It's like disciplines. What a small price to pay for good health. What an easy thing to do an apple a day. I mean. A few things gives you such an incredible return that the price almost disappears. Promise is stronger than object, you got that? The bigger and the more powerful the why, the how gets easier and easier and easier. freedom to find out what the truth is, 
That's why I won't call myself a truther, because I don't know what the truth is. I know what the truth isn't, which is pretty well everything they tell us. But what is the truth? And I'd like to know as much as anybody else, but the fact of the matter is we don't have the freedom to know. People can go out there and pretend to be gurus or pretend that they know all this and know all that. Most of the time they don't. I mean, even when we discovered Tartaria and discovered the, the ancient civilization that exists right under our noses, right in all of our modern cities, just scattered in amongst them. You know, when we first discovered that, it made me realize that everything I thought about history is wrong. I mean, I knew history was wrong. I wrote a book about it. I wrote all this stuff and I still agree with a lot of the stuff that's in the book. But so much of it was all based on the concept that the timeline was, was correct. It was all based on the concept that, you know, we'd actually built these cultures up from the ground up and it was done by our societies. And not that we moved in and simply took over real estate, but we did. That's all we did. So, you know, the truth, whatever you think the truth is, seems to be subject to change. You know, the truth seems to be based on what people believe the truth to be, which is why I've often said belief is the enemy of knowledge. You've got to establish the freedom to find out what the truth is and don't allow yourself to believe anything. If you're going to believe in anything, believe in your own sovereignty, believe in your own freedom, believe in your own power to make change, your own power to have the idea that could change the world. No matter what your status in society, you know, no matter whether you're rich or poor or physically abled or not, you could still have the idea that could change the world because everything that we see here is all based on ideas. It's just an idea. All around the world, you see this recurring theme in different cultures, and it's described in different ways, but exactly the same in theme. We have a force, an expression of this Watiko that takes a reptilian form. And the cultures around the world, again and again and again, when they're doing their creation myths, then some kind of reptilian, lizard-like, snake-like entities are described. So if you take the biblical version, you have Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And Adam and Eve are symbolic of, first of all, what humans were like before what became known as the fall. What the hell was the fall? The way I've seen this is that there was once not something that you call human. It was a state of consciousness that was experiencing a world, a frequency band, that was like the one we're experiencing, but on a much higher level of awareness, consciousness, frequency. So things weren't happening in dense matter and low, slow frequencies. They were happening on a high frequency. Things were much more ethereal. That there is a field of energy and that we have the language to use that field. This is an actual page out of the Gospel of Thomas. So we know that this, this ancient gospel actually existed. And you can, uh, you can see some of the letters. These are Greek letters. You can actually read some of, if you know Greek, you can see some of the Greek letters right here. In the Gospel of Thomas, two very important keys. This was written uh, right around 300 uh, years after the time of Jesus. In this gospel, okay, so here, here's what we're doing. We've been in the Buddhist monasteries in Tibet, and they're telling us that we must, that feeling is the prayer, one. Two, that we must feel as if our prayers have already been answered. Okay, and now we're in an Egyptian monastery with the texts that used to be our tradition before they were edited. And we're going to look at the instructions that tell us how to do that. Okay, if we do that, is that good? Okay, Gospel of Thomas. If you have a copy of the Gospel of Thomas, this is verse 106, translated from the Nag Hammadi Library. And if you do not have a copy, it's in our books, uh, and you can, you can go to any library and pick this up. Verse 106. Look at what the lost Gospel of Thomas says. It says, when you make the two thought and emotion one, so the Gospel of Thomas is talking about thought and emotion. It's saying when you make your thought and your emotion one, look at what happens. 
you will say to the mountain, mountain, move away, and the mountain will move away. Saying that when you can marry your thought and your emotion into one single potent force, that is when you have the power to speak. Let's go back to the Gospel of Thomas, another verse. Now, this is verse 48. It says almost the same thing. This was so important that it was recorded at least three different times in the same gospel. Look at what this says. If the two make peace with each other in this one house, when Jesus is talking about the house or the temple, what is he talking about? What is he talking about? Precisely you, you are the house, you are the temple. If the two make peace with each other in this house, if thought and emotion become one, if they make peace, with each other in this house, look what happens. They will say to the mountain, move away, and it will move away. He's telling us again in a completely different verse how powerful it is to marry thought and emotion. But they still haven't told us how. How do you do this? That's the next piece. In the early Christian Bible, your Bible today, there is a passage. How many have heard, ask and you shall receive? Have you heard that before? Ask and you shall receive. Have you heard that? I know people that ask and ask and ask and nothing happens because the asking is not done with the voice. The asking is not done, please, please bring this to my world. That's not asking. To ask, we must speak to the field, to the divine matrix in the language that the field recognizes. In a language that's meaningful, the field doesn't recognize our voice, it recognizes the power of our heart. Remember this morning, our heart, we have a feeling, creates electrical waves, magnetic waves. That's the language the field recognizes. So when you create the feeling in your heart as if your prayer is already answered, that creates the electrical and the magnetic waves that bring that answer to you. And you're going to see this in just a moment. Ask and you shall receive. While we still have this passage in our text, in the Bible that you have today, the King James Version, John 16, 23, 24, what you have is the condensed version. You have the edited version. The edited version looks like this. This is the edited version. Whatsoever ye ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name, Okay. Ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Okay, this is the edited version. This is so amazing to me because they took out the two sentences that tell us how to ask. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. That sounded pretty optimistic again. But, but... Again, I think it's a description of the structure of existential reality, and, and by, by which I mean, when I'm in my clinical practice and I observe, and this is also the case with my students, is let's say, people's lives aren't what they would like them to be. And so then you ask, why? Well, forget about tragedy and catastrophe, because that's self-evident, and we're not going to discuss that. Although the degree to which you bring about your own tragedy is always indeterminate. But I would never say that every terrible thing that is visited on a person is something they deserved. I think that that's a very dangerous presupposition, especially because everyone gets sick and everyone dies. But one of the main reasons that people don't get what they want is because they don't actually figure out what it is.